You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to the Question Reality Radio Show. I'm Priscilla Leona, producer and host of this show, and we are coming to you live, not from the Oscars, which we are literally literally a couple blocks from. I mean, I could walk to the Oscars right now. Of course, they wouldn't let me in, but I could still walk there if I wanted to. That's how close we are. Uh, Los Angeles, California. Now, for 13 years, this show has been providing our audience with entertainment industry career advice. This show is for you If you are questioning your career reality, nice little tie in there to the show title, uh, by thinking about pursuing a career in show business, or if you're already working in the entertainment industry and you're just interested in giving tips, uh, advice, or resource information, or finding out how to elevate your career status. So either way, we're here for you. Now, The guests on this show include Emmy winners, Grammy winners, Tony Award winners, reality TV stars, tons of working professionals, which are producers and directors and casting directors, agents, talent managers, screenwriters, PR agents. We have publicists, actors, comedians, singers, novelists, script supervisors, stunt people, entertainment lawyers. The list goes on and on. Are you working in the entertainment industry? You're going to be on this show. I'm going to hunt you down and force you to come on this show. Bribery is not an option, but sometimes it is. If you missed any of our shows, here are the three ways that you can listen to past shows. Number one, the free mobile apps, the LA Talk Radio free mobile apps, which you can obviously get on the App Store or the Google Play Store. Number two, you can listen to our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Amazon Podcasts, Google, Audible, and Stitcher.com. Third, archive page listen directly from the website that you're listening to us now you just i don't know where what page you're on while you're listening never actually done it myself but uh you can find us on the archive page the latalkradio.com website page uh look for our show title question reality under the channel one link and look for my name priscilla leona under our host tab and we ask that you very very kindly please subscribe to our podcasts uh give us a little thumb go to all my pages on facebook priscilla leona twitter priscilla leona i think i'm all priscilla yeah facebook twitter instagram branding very important when you're branding you gotta be consistent keep the same name figure it out put deep thought nothing cutesy nothing you know poppy you gotta be professional and just brand it and keep it because it's going to follow you on the internet for the rest of your life so choose wisely uh finally if you want to be booked on our show or refer someone to be a guest to promote themselves showcase their projects products and help listeners by providing career advice you have to go to our official website now this is different you have to focus and listen to the different website address it is questionrealityradioshow.com questionrealityradioshow.com not the website that you're listening to us on now which is obviously latalkradio.com now this is the website that you're listening to now where we obviously air the show. So again, please go to questionrealityradioshow.com. And that's also where you can see our annual guest schedule. You might want to go there and take a peek at who the upcoming guests are. Check out their sites. So to be submitted and booked on our show, just click the contact link. Really, really, really easy and short. And we just need your name, email, title, and website. And that's it. You're on your way to talking to me live. All oh, thrill, thrill, excitement, excitement. Right? <laughs> okay. For some, maybe. All right. So 
today, very excited to have a guest back on our show. He was on here a couple months ago, I think, yeah, months. And we have him back today, and we are going to talk to him a little bit later. His name is Mark Hoberman. He is an author and a motivational speaker, and we love him dearly, and we're going to talk to him. He's here to promote his latest book, and it's called... Oh, I'm reading previous titles, Opportunity in Disguise, How I Defeated Adversity, and we are going to talk to him, but first, we are so excited. We have to tell you and say congratulations to our friend, Bernie Martin, who is in LA right now as we speak at the Oscars, dressing celebrities for Oscar night. Yes. He is an amazing fashion designer, and we love Bernie. Um, go check out his website. It's catuwear.com. That's C-A-T-O-U-W-E-A-R.com, catuwear. And boy, if I had known in advance that Bernie was going to be here, I should have assumed that Bernie was dressing celebrities at the Oscars, but I did not even bother to ask him. I would have asked him to slip me in the exit door, or at least some door, basement door or something, because I'm telling you, I know that Harry Styles is at the Oscars. I just know it, and everybody knows my obsession and how I'm insane over Harry Styles. Somebody help me before I drop dead of COVID and Hook me up with a piece of Harry's hair. I'd like to personally pull it out, uh, but in a very loving, romantic, sexual way. Nothing weird and creepy like snipping it with scissors. So if anybody knows, help me out. All right. So back to our guest today. Again, congratulations, Bernie Martin. Go to his website, catuwear.com, and give him a little thumb up on all of the uh, social media sites. Now, today, Mark Hoberman is here. Let's go to his website, too, uh, markhoberman.com. It's M-A-R-C, not a K, M-A-R-C-H-O-B-E-R-M-A-N.com. He also has the website gradesuccess.com, G R A D E success.com and let me just tell you a a little bit just a little bit a little bit a little bit about old marky marky mark mark hoberman's story is one that has inspired teens and adults both i would imagine even children because they're very precocious and very intelligent at a very young age now at 16 mark hoberman received a diagnosis of epilepsy and despite this challenge at such a young age mark persevered and achieved a very successful career he is a former english teacher with over 30 years experience as well as a camp administrator and a consultant and through his life experiences he's been able to help people uh, help them reach reach their potential and basically see ways to avoid negative outcomes and point them in the right direction find a new direction is what he says and his motto is from the classroom to the boardroom Mark, his training method, they're fun, they're interactive, but most importantly, they're impactful. So this is very important. This is a very impressive man that we have on the show today. I feel like he should be walking down a red carpet at the Oscars and have wind blowing through his hair and a theme song. Yes. So without further ado, welcome, Mark Hoberman. Leona, thank you so much. Priscilla. You did it Priscilla. again, you <laughs> pulled <laughs> me, Leona. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> That's the end. And right after you spelled my name correctly and you gave it with a C. So I owe you a big I one. Priscilla, did. thank you so you much. Call yes. me it's like, hey, I tell Hoberman. You. Hey, Hoberman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I just I just saw you running after Harry Styles with scissors and it totally threw me off. 
Oh, guys, yeah, this is true. <laughs> if anybody saw me running after Harry Styles, every SWAT, <laughs> every SWAT team in four counties would be after me. Oh, exactly. my gosh, Charity. that is crazy. So I, um, uh, you were on the show last time talking about your company with Mr. Janal. I, God, I hope I don't butcher his name, J- Janal Holmes. And, um, right. and I was so, so excited that you agreed to come back on and talk about your book. First of all, I want to say congratulations on oppor- the book Opportunity in Disguise, How I Defeated Adversity. But, you know, I have to ask something because I see that it's referred to as a book. Then I see it referred to as a memoir and then as a self-help book. And a friend of mine I was talking to at a disco party on Friday night said, well, what's the difference between those three? And I'm like, oh, oh well, you'll have to tune into my show on Sunday because I'm going to ask that question to Mark Hoberman. So can you please clarify for her which is the accurate title of your book or titles? Because a book can be in different category of titles. Um, and explain that. So, so, so sure. So a book can be any book. It could be fiction. It could be nonfiction. Uh, a memoir is uh, is nonfiction and it's a story about somebody's life. So this memoir happens to be a self-help book. If it was a memoir about somebody's uh, life as a comedian, it wouldn't be considered self-help. But this definitely has a genre of memoir, but within the self-help genre. Right. And I actually can't see a book of a comedian as a self-help book. Yeah, exactly. I'm that comedian's on to say help. I need some help. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Your your sense of humor uh, is definitely part of the, we'll call it a memoir, because that's what I Mm -hmm. saw it as. Um, I saw it's yourself, your sense of humor is uh, definitely part of a memoir. That's what it said on your page. So hopefully I'm I'm calling it that. Would you prefer me to call it a book or a memoir? It is more like a memoir. Memoir is fine. Okay. So how did you come up? With the title of your book, uh, this is a very good title. It's very self-explanatory, but everybody has a reason for coming up with a specific title. So if you could tell us how you came up with the title and what is the book about? Sure. So first of all, this is a re-release of, of, of my memoir when it was self-published under Adversity Defeated, Turn Your Struggles Into Strength. Uh, when my publicist, B. Davis from Sassy B., Worldwide, found me a publisher, a traditional publisher, LaRue Press, uh, Janice Hermsen over in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, they came up with, we worked it out together, but she really came up with Opportunity in Disguise, How I Defeated Adversity. Because it, it means different things to different people, but certainly in my life, this was an opportunity in disguise. Because I, I tell people, I'm not the man I am despite my illness, I'm the man I have become because of my illness. Absolutely. So, now, you had a lot of adversity as a teen, which I would imagine where the adversity path started. Why don't you tell us and start with that? And then we'll move into your struggles as an adult and then how you overcame adversity. Sure. So uh, I was born in Yonkers, New York. And when, my, when I was 16, my father came in the room and said, I'm going to semi retire. We're moving to Florida. And he said, you know, Three something. I said, oh, my God, three months. That's too quick. And he said, no, three weeks. So as a 16-year-old, I had three weeks. And here I was, a very macho clarinet player. I was uh, the first clarinetist in the band. I had friends and and a girlfriend. And I'm a teenager. And now I'm moving to a place where I almost know nobody. I know my cousins were there. Luckily, Samantha and my grandmother. Otherwise, no friends, nobody. So so that in itself is, is adversity for any teenager, especially at the age of 16. I'm looking forward to the prom the following year. So we go there, and probably two or three months into it, I'm getting very upset and kind of a little depressed, uh, but I'm, I'm starting to finally meet some people. And my cousin uh, is told by my father, uh, Mark, your cousin Mark, that's me, but I'm known as Mark David. He's Mark Jed. Uh, Mark David de- is very depressed. Why don't you invite him to school? He invites me to college, to the University of Florida in Gainesville. I get in the car at 5 in the morning because I want to get there by 9 9 or 10 a.m. from Fort Lauderdale. I have his sister, my other cousin in the car, and we're going and going. And I pass the, uh, I pass the exit. No big deal. 
I go again, my, and the second time, my cousin says, Mark David, you passed the exit. The third time, I don't know what she said. I was unconsciously conscious. I, I did not know what was going on because when I passed those, uh, the, the exit the first two times, I was having what I can tell you now was a petite mal seizure. And unfortunately, two minutes later, it turned into a grand mal seizure. And I had that grand mal seizure behind my 1977 Ford Mustang. And uh, instead of stepping down during the seizure on the brake, I stepped on the gas. We went through a toll booth that my cousin had to use the steering wheel to get us through. Cops came. We almost went, ran right through a barrier. And two hours later, uh, Priscilla, I came home with a, a bunch of pills and a diagnosis of epilepsy. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And, of course, they must have thought you were a bunch of partying teenagers drunk behind the wheel. And, uh, gosh, that must have been absolute. Did they, when, when, that, when the police arrived, were you unconscious where they had to take you to the hospital because of the injuries being in the crash? Or were you unconscious because of, still unconscious because of the seizure? Well, luckily, there was no major crash. We just went through a little bit of the toll booth. But you, you really you really protected it pretty well because uh, the police came. I don't know this. I was not fully conscious. Uh, and and my, uh, they said to my cousin, what drugs is he on? And she said, my cousin right. doesn't take any drugs. And I got up and I said, I'm fine. And got out of the car and fainted. But not, luckily, a police officer caught me. And they put me right in an ambulance. Oh, my gosh. So you're 16. You're diagnosed with having epilepsy. Did they talk to you in the hospital and say, well, we can manage it. There are pills, shots. What did they tell you to help you alleviate mental anguish? They told me nothing. Uh, I, I, at the time, you know, we're talking 42 years ago. Uh, I did not have a good time with the doctors in Florida. They just gave me a, a bottle of, of pills, Dilantin at the time. Uh, didn't even call my parents. Uh, I, I went home. My parents were out, I think, on a flea market. They came back and I showed them the pills, told them what happened. And that's kind of where the Aldina started. But nobody t told me anything. There was no book out there. My parents did okay medically later on, getting me a good doctor. But had a book like mine been out in the market then they would have fared better so there was nothing they kept it secret i kept it secret big mistake which is one of the reasons why i, I felt i had to write the uh, the memoir and i uh, just didn't medically not a good two years in florida wow yeah well then you then so 16 you become an adult now had you been able in the years uh, uh after that to find a medication that worked did your doctor did your parents take you to specialists or doctors that could find pills for you to help manage the epilepsy or was there absolutely not much going on for epilepsy back then well we'll talk the first two years in florida i had probably in my life 21 seizures about 18 in florida and many of those seizures were while i was on medication and my oh. father said, I'm going to go back into business, but also we have to move back to New York. They're not helping you here. Mm -hmm. We went and, they, and my father did research. He called the Epilepsy Center. He called the Mayo Clinic. He called Columbia Presbyterian in Manhattan. And uh, we found a doctor who saved my life. His name was Dr. Eli Goldenson. Uh, he sat with us for 45 minutes, asked questions into a dictaphone. Previously, I hadn't been asked more than three questions by doctors. He asked about 70. Uh, and then... Three days later, a letter came to the house, a big, big envelope, actually. And it said it was the, the transcript of everything that he said he asked I answered. At the bottom, it said, here is a script for a new medication called valproic acid. It's rather new in this country. This will help your son. And on that medication, I never had a seizure again. Wow. What is it called? It was called valproic acid. It hurt my stomach. And then they changed it to something called Depakine. And then it, it morphed into something called Depakote, all the same medication. And I only had a, a seizure once in my life, 35, almost 40 years later. But on that, on that medication, I was absolutely, totally controlled. And I'm very lucky. I've joined a lot of epilepsy groups, spoken to hundreds of epileptics. I, I spoke at the uh, Bergen County, New Jersey Epilepsy Foundation. And I'm definitely one of the lucky ones.
Wow. And and you didn't be you didn't grow um not grow but you didn't become what is it called when you're on a a medication so long you become immune to it. Um Right. You, so you know I did, what I did not become immune to it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. No. Okay. It didn't lose its that it, it didn't lose its efficacy over the years. It did okay. not. But uh but there were side effects. Uh oh. I don't know. I I got to tell you, uh you tell me a side effect and I'm having it cuz I said to the doctor at one, I was about 18 when I went to him, almost 19. I said, what's the side effects? He said, I'm not telling you. I said, why not? He said, if I tell you the side effects, you'll have them in two hours. So he said, oh. something bothers you, that's off. You call me, then I'll tell you if it's a side effect. So oh. I didn't have any of the side effects. There is a side effect that they test for because it does give you uh, liver damage. It can give you liver damage. But in 35, 40 years, no, no liver damage whatsoever. But... Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I would say when I'm 24, because uh, you can't, people who have their first seizure as teens or, or younger, they can grow out of it as adults. But remember, I had my first seizure, we knew of at 16. Then we realized I had one when I was 13, but it was never diagnosed and no tests really showed that I was epileptic. I hit my head. They said, maybe you're failing one of these tests because of your head injury. Never had another problem again. But then, you know, I'm 24 now, and the doctor says, you've been fully controlled for eight years, but maybe the medication is not what's controlling you. Maybe you've outgrown it. I said, well, how do we find out? And he said, we have to take you off the medication. Now, at that time, I want to say I was about 25, just got married, 26. And they said, if you're off medication for 18 months and no seizure, you're good to go. Well, of course, in the 16th month, I had a seizure in the Bronx while I was... Uh, teaching during the day. I was not teaching that period. Luckily, I was walking down the hall. I had a seizure. But Priscilla, here's the problem. I didn't tell anybody I had epilepsy. So when I had the seizure, they found me in the hallway bleeding and they shut the school for an hour and called the police because I chipped my tooth. I was bleeding. All they saw was blood and me writhing on the floor. They thought I was stabbed. Wow. I, I kept it to myself. There were family members that didn't even know. So that's when I was off the medication. And, uh, they, they put me back on. I was on for probably 20, almost 30 years after that. And I'll tell you later on what happened 30 years later. But well, yeah, what, that, that, what, that, that, what strategies did you use for overcoming that adversity from the teen into the adult? I mean, did, did someone talk to you about coming out with a plan or did you come up with a plan for your, by yourself? Excellent question. So, I want to first talk about what I didn't do and what I did wrong. Okay. All the years that I taught, even the years now that I tutor and, and speak, I always talk about opposites. And I do believe in letting people make, make their own mistakes. But I wrote the book so people wouldn't make the same mistakes I made. So for two years, I did nothing. My mother came into the room the day that I was diagnosed and said, look, you have friends, you're a good looking young man, you're funny. And guess what? You're also an epileptic. Now, my mother was a very strong woman. She had a stroke at 39 had a 95% recovery, didn't let it stop her. And she said, this will keep you grounded. Now I heeded her advice, but the first two years I did not. I was definitely, I was not clinically diagnosed as depressed, but I can tell you after over the three decades in teaching, I know I was clinically depressed, crying many nights, didn't tell people, friends, family members. And uh, then finally, after about a year and a half, I said, uh, and this is the mantra of my book, don't let your struggles define you, you define you. And, and that's an important piece of the memoir because I was a teenager. There was no internet. You can learn about epilepsy in 40 minutes like you can now. It took me two months. And the number two is a very strong number in the memoir because I, for, I, for two years, I was depressed. And for two months, I went to the library. I went and I looked up in the periodical room on a machine called Microfiche, which no one, no one over the you know, age of 20 knows what I'm talking about because uh, I'm mean, <laughs> under the age of 20. Because they said, what's that? They thought I was talking about a micro fish, half my students. I when know, I, them I know. Memoir. So uh, I learned about it. I wrote to the Epilepsy Foundation. I called some hospitals. And uh, I just started to make sure that, you know, I talk about embracing the enemy. I was not going to let it define who I was. I was going to learn about it. I was going to know what things I could do and couldn't do. I was going to lead the best life I possibly could. And it took longer than it should have. But that... Uh, coupled with the fact that I really became my own support system, which I also think is important and I'm sure we'll get into later. That is really what happened. So what did I do moving forward? Uh, I used my sense of humor. 
I took care of myself physically. I took my medication. Uh, th- there are things that can spike a seizure in somebody who has epilepsy, lack of sleep, uh, drugs, alcohol, stress. I had to watch that all the time. And I became, uh, I'll tell you, Priscilla, I really became really one with my body because I was always three seconds ahead of my brain. How am I feeling at this moment? If I was talking, I have something called the deja vu effect. If I was feeling that, I always thought in my own head, how am I doing now? How am I feeling? I always checked in with myself, if that makes sense. It really does. And I, I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that you, uh, I, I don't know what, per, I don't know if you know percentages. That's a very iffy topic. Most people don't know, but I'm going to ask anyway. What percentage of Americans in this country, Americans in this country, well, people, should I say, let's be careful. Uh, what percentage of people in this country have epilepsy or some form of I'm, it? So I'm not really sure of that number. I know that it's well over a million five hundred thousand epileptics, but I don't know if that's diagnosed each year or to- mm-hmm. total number. But I'm amazed at how many people I speak to uh, who tell me, "Oh, I have epilepsy," or "My my nephew has epilepsy." I'll tell you that when I taught in the Bronx, there were no HIPAA laws. So this is this is my, as my students say, "This is my bad." So I would get a big teachers would get a big giant tin box, and you'd open it up. And it would have a folder for each kid. And it told you everything about the kid, allergic to bee stings. If there were parents with drug problems, if the kid's family was arrested, where the kid was born, who he lives with. And it told you all of their illnesses. And you see asthma. But I saw minimally 10 to 15 kids through my years that had epilepsy. And I am embarrassed and almost ashamed to tell you that as an educator, I it even said sometimes their, their medication. And I saw the side effects. The side effects when I was still on uh, the first medication, uh, Dilantin, was bleeding gums. And I saw kids with gums bleeding, and they would say, Mr. Hoban, my gums are bleeding. I don't know why. But I knew why, because I knew they were epileptics, and I knew what medication they were on. And I was so embarrassed with the stigma, and I was so afraid of people thinking it would be a weakness that I never spoke to those children and said, I'm with you, I understand. And that's totally changed my last, you know, when the book came out, my last four or five years teaching. And that was, that was bad. I mean, I was an educator uh, in the Bronx. You know, a lot of the kids came from single family homes. It was a rather poor neighborhood. And I definitely could help these people and I did it. So now it's, it's my obligation to pay that forward now that I can. Well, so many years went by. What actually made you finally decide to write this book? Was it a particular incident or thought, or had you always thought, you know what, I'm having such a hard time getting information. One day I'm going to write a book. What actually got you to the point? So interesting. So actually now I just saw my notes that it's uh, 1.2, about 1% of the population have epilepsy, but that comes to more than 3.4 million people nationwide, just to give you that scary number. So uh, because people hear 1% and they say, ah, not so bad. But uh, to be honest, I I wrote the memoir 15 years ago, started two chapters. Life got in the way. I got busy. I was uh, running my tutoring business. I was working full time in the summer uh, as a teacher. I was working at camps in the summer. And life just started to pass by that way. And I I put the book aside. Well, when my son, uh, who is now 23, was 15, uh, he came, uh, he had very bad, he was diagnosed with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And I saw him get very depressed, happy-go-lucky kid, funny, lots of friends, and talk about deja vu all over again. And I was looking at this, and then I just went into not old Mark mode, I went into new Mark mode. Found the right, doc- right doctors, spoke to him, and my wife took me aside once and said, you know, not that you're... You seem so unemotional about this, but you're so methodical. How are you not emotional about this? Because I am an emotional person. And I said uh, to my wife, I said, Ivy, I have to tell you, I live this. So I can help him. And I can help you. And I can help me. We're not going to be the parents my parents were. They did the best job they could, but they were emotional wrecks back then. So then then when I helped him, got the right help, emotionally, almost as importantly as physically and medically, I said, well, the educator life all went off. I have no choice. I have to finish the memoir now. And that's what, that was the impetus to finishing this. Well, did you, now did, 
did you learn anything new about yourself while you were writing this book? A lot of people s discover things about themselves. Wow. So uh, I have to tell you that, remember, 10 people knew I had epilepsy for the 35 years or more that I was diagnosed. Now, 10 people knew, but four of them were doctors. My best friend knew, my wow. parents, my sister, maybe one other friend and, and a relative, less, fewer than 10. So I, I put pen to paper, the, 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 the book comes out, and I, I'm going to put it on Facebook, and I'm staring at the screen. A good 20 minutes. My wife comes down, comes to the office and says, what are you staring at? And I said, nobody knows that I have epilepsy. I said, and this is social media time. A thousand people are going to know in the next 10 seconds once I hit the, the click button. That was not easy because I said, to be honest, if I never hit this button, the send button, if I never post this, this is the best thing I ever did in my life. Because, and, and, I, and as an English teacher, I know uh, uh, how cathartic writing can be and how wonderful journaling can be and how healthy and helpful it could be. I said, if I do nothing else and put this in the drawer and just look at it once in a while, best, most rewarding thing I ever did. But I decided to hit the post button and uh, I never looked back. It was phenomenal. And I did, I, you know, as I got older, the stigma didn't matter as much to me, but I'm not gonna lie to you. It's not like the stigma went away when I was 21. It went away when I was in my late 40s, early 50s. Unacceptable, I would never allow that to happen again. I would never allow anyone who I'm working with or know or love or I'm friendly with to let that happen to them. But uh, what changed was me. What changed was my, instead of the stigma and the shame was the pride in knowing this couldn't stop me, was the pride in knowing that I would embrace this enemy. And uh, as, as it says in, Ju in Julius Caesar, uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Well, epilepsy was my enemy and I made it my friend. Oh, I love that. That is Now, is this book that going to be the first and only book or are are you going to write another one and do you want uh, are is each book going to stand on its own or are you trying to build a body of work uh with connections between the books so uh i i wrote a book called highly effective teaching strategies winning in the classroom and uh that's for teachers and i do teaching workshops all the time and it stands on its own but in my life, in my teaching, in my presentations, in my motivational speaking, I have to put in my sense of humor because that's what works for me. So that's always in there. And, uh, and I do mention the epilepsy, however, briefly when I, when I talk to teachers because I, that was my connection to kids who were suffering. I don't want people to think, though, Priscilla, this is a, a memoir about epilepsy. It's a memoir about overcoming adversity. My adversity just happened to be epilepsy. This will help people overcome all adversity, people who are bullied, have dealt with gender issues, family problems, even work adversity, family struggles, things like that. So I have that book. Now I'm also working, uh, I have a book coming out this summer with Dr. Cass Henry called The Resiliency Playbook. And you know it's heavily connected with that because I built my resiliency and I just had to shortcut it to people. I, I don't want the average person to take 35 years to realize, hey, this is not gonna define who you are. Let it take them a week. Let them take them four months. But decades, there was no reason for that. So these books all do stand on their own. And I co-authored some other books. I've co-authored a book. And it was about adversity. I co-authored a book, A Journey to Recovery, Speaks of Writing with Stephen Hill. He's a former tutoring student and opioid addict. Just passed the bar exam, actually, uh, last month. Uh, uh, a student's parent, uh, Gloria Key. I co-authored A Key That Turned, Unlocking My Master Plan. So I, I, I find my space in any kind of adversity and helping people become better. And that's where the self-help aspect comes in. So they well, stand I, alone, but, but they all speak to who I am. I love how you're bringing your motivational, motivational program to schools and you do it either virtually or in person. And I know you go to a lot of schools, but I don't know what's going on now with the COVID if they're bringing that that particular uh in person and the uh, audience type stuff back but uh, you discuss in very important topics as you said the anti-bullying the drug abuse uh prevention you talk about peer pressure of overcoming adversity you talk about team building and communication skills are they all 
integrated and tied in to you from not only being a teacher for 30 years and camp administrator and consultant and having epilepsy is is that where you've seen you know the bullying and the drug abuse and the peer pressure is that how you're you're able to talk about that from personal attestment well i i can talk about that because i wasn't bullied a lot but i talk about a couple of bullying episodes but in, in 33 years of teaching i've seen a lot of bullying and, and it went from bullying in person to of course you know, over three decades, then it came, it came into cyberbullying. So I always bring my life into it because I feel and I know there's just a different connection with an audience. But I have to tell you, I've done anti-bullying for first and second graders, middle, high school, college and corporate. And I'm telling you, Priscilla, the only difference is the age of the people in front of me. The seven-year-old bully from elementary school is the 42-year-old bully manager mm-hmm. from the corporate world. And although I do really fun, interactive and powerful and emotional role plays and group dynamics and debriefs, they all are are just for the audience that's in front of me at the time, but they all connect. And it all does come from my experiences. Absolutely. Uh, And do you have, because I know that you, you do these seminars. So if somebody wanted to reach out to you and talk to you privately, maybe they don't want to come see uh, in a big symposium, how would they contact you to do a one-on-one? Do you do one-on-one consultations or talks or or just, how would somebody reach you to do that? There's two ways. Uh, the website to the best, which you said earlier, gradesuccess.com, markhoberman.com, mark with a C. But uh, they can always reach me at info at gradesuccess.com. And I also have mark at markhoberman.com. I want people to be able to reach me any, any way they want. I have social media under Mark Hoberman, Great Success, everything. The LinkedIn, the Instagram. Uh, I even have some videos uh, on TikTok. So any of those ways uh, they, they can oh, reach I don't, me. And, and I, I got to add you to my TikTok. You gotta send me your link. I don't. I I don't have you on TikTok. I literally just started TikTok. I haven't posted one damn thing because I'm checking <laughs> it out first. I don't know what's going on with that TikTok. I mean, there's some fun stuff, but yeah, I'm digging, I'm I'm slowly putting my toe in the water. So please send me your TikTok because I just started. I've got like five people. I started it like yesterday. So most people, oh, my friends, are not on TikTok. So send me your TikTok. Now is um. I, I wanted to just briefly to talk about the career ready because I've I switched it. We're gonna we're gonna read a part of your book, but real quick um, because I know a lot of people uh, want to know this. You said this is a self published book. Am I right? Self published. The book and was so- no. The book was self. The book was self published. Okay. I was very lucky in that it was picked up by Larue Press, a, 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 an indie publisher. So it was re released under this title. About. Yeah, that's yeah. what I want to talk about because a lot of people on the show send me questions and say, um, "I can't get a literary agent. I don't know if it's because my book is bad, or I don't know how, or da da da." And I've had to self-publish, but I'm not able to still get a literary agent. And of course, you know what is what's the answer to that? Because you're the first person I think that I've talked to that ha- that self-published and then was picked up by an agent. So can you briefly say, tell people via your greatest expert advice, how to do that? Definitely. So that, that's the part of my business where, where I, I co-author other books with people and it's, it's very difficult. So I'll tell you that it's very rare. You're correct that you get, you self publish and then you get a literary agent and even further a publisher. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy, much easier now to self-publish than it used to be. But to get an agent, you have to learn what's called a query letter. And a lot of these things can be found, found online. And there are some good companies. There are some legitimate companies and some not so legitimate companies. So you do have to be careful with how you're spending your money and your time. But uh, an agent is, is a very strong route. And I had a couple of agents who were interested. I didn't like the contracts, quite honestly. So I kept it on my own because I really... My my in my mind, I didn't care so much how many books sold. And when it when it first came out, it was an Amazon uh, bestseller. Um, and uh, I I care more about speaking and spreading the word. I, I'm a teacher by trade. I like to entertain and get out there. But 
you know, to get that agent, you know, there's a book called Writer's, uh, I, can't remember, I have to think, of, the Writer's Handbook or something like that. There's a writer's book that has all the agents in it. But I'm telling you, this is a crazy business. When I would email them, I mean, within three months of, the, of this book, it gets updated every year coming out. All of a sudden, these people are out of business already. So you would write to agents with a query letter and they want to know a lot. What can you do to sell the book yourself? Uh, who's your audience that you have to tell them and research a lot of work. What's the competition out there for, for your book or your memoir? So it's a lot of work, but it can be done. Uh, you know, you can, there are many self-published people who sold many, many, many hundreds of thousands of copies also. So we're in a world now where you don't have to have a publisher or an agent. It's much better if you do. In my case, I was blessed to meet B. Davis, who's my publicist, and I call her the great connector. And she hooked me up with LaRue Press, and they, they, they saw a copy of the, of the uh, memoir, loved it, and picked it up. We've done work for six months on it. So it's, it's a, for me as an educator, it's the journey that I loved so much also. Other people are just, print me now, print me now, publish me now. It does not happen overnight like that, but you have to just stay the course. It takes a lot of fortitude and a lot of perseverance, but you can look at do, there's companies that do it. Do you yeah. recommend that someone, because uh, exactly what you said, I've been trying to explain to people it, back in the day, uh, if you were a musician or a singer and you wanted to become a star, if you were discovered by an A&R rep singing, then they would pay for everything. They do the PR, the publicity, everything was paid for, and then they take that out, et cetera. I don't go into that. But And that is what a literary, a publishing company used to do for you also if you had a literary agent. Now, they are just like the record labels. A record label will only take you on if you have established yourself. They want you to write. They want you to record. They want you to come with... To to them with the package already ready and then they'll think about it and but most important they're going to ask you what is your digital social media footprint and that is my message to everyone um, a lot of artists they want to focus on their artistry their talent just you know writing or singing or playing guitar or their instrument but it is so important to have a digital social media footprint it's absolutely vital in promoting and maintaining and advancing your career in any field so uh, you really have to do it. And if you don't want to deal with the business aspect, find somebody who wants to, a wife, a husband, a daughter, a sister, friend, somebody who believes in you and will do it for you because you can't, playing your guitar and singing like Adele in your garage is not going to get you anywhere. This is all about the new world, which is social media. That's how you spread yourself. How many people have been discovered via YouTube, promoting themselves on YouTube? Well, it's the same with being self-published you really do have to uh if you can't get a literary agent you can't get yourself together enough to do it you can self-publish and then hopefully mark Oberman's route will be the way it will eventually go but you can't count on that it's a lot of work you know when you're an entrepreneur you are the sales department the marketing department you're the accounting department you're the every department that's in a business that's who you are so if you want to be successful successful in anything you really have to you have to realize that's what it's going to take or you better find somebody who believes in you enough to do it for you one or the other well it is almost that time and i want to get a little passage read by you mark hoberman you know i wanted to start with my favorite passage but i'm going to let you take over and you read whatever you want and once mark is finished we are going that is the end of the show so i just want to tell you now please check out his website markhoberman.com and gradesuccess.com and and I want to thank you so much, Mr. Mark Hoberman. I love saying your name. It sounds like something you would eat as a pastry. Mark Hoberman, Danish <laughs> cinnamon swirl. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I love it. So tell us, uh, we're going to have Mark read from you from his memoir, Opportunity in Disguise, How I Defeated Adversity. And he's going to take the show out. Now, at the end of your passage, say, Thank you to your fans, and that'll be the end of the show. You're closing us out. Excellent. Well, first of all, Priscilla, I want to thank you so much for having me on the show again. It's always great speaking with you and, 
and uh, hearing your thoughts and your, 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 your amazing questions. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for having me on the show again. Thank you. You're welcome, Mark Hoberman, lost in Yonkers. Keep yeah, going. that's right. I was lost in Yonkers many times. I know. <laughs> so uh, here, I'll read the introduction and then I'll, I'll sign us out. Uh, the things in life that help us become successful and fulfilled can be based upon both positive and negative experiences. Our friends, family, colleagues, and personal decisions all assist us in becoming the people we see in the mirror each morning. In my case, a seizure disorder has taken me on many journeys in the past 35 years. These sojourns have allowed me to delve deeply into my soul and understand the many facets of my moral fiber and the character of those with whom I choose to surround myself. Some may see my illness as a weakness. However, I view it as an incredible strength and opportunity to educate myself and others. I have disclosed my infirmity to fewer than 10 people since I was first diagnosed over 35 years ago. The search for my identity has ended and just begun. I believe that I have now initiated the process to seize each day and every opportunity, not in spite of my illness, but because of it. As an educator, I am always struggling to think of new ways to impart knowledge to others. I wrote this book to remind myself and others of the importance of self-worth and inner strength. It is my hope that readers find strength, humor, and inspiration while reading Opportunity in Disguise, How I Defeated Adversity. I want to thank my fans. I want to certainly thank Priscilla's fans. And thank you for listening tonight. It was great to share this time with you. Thank you, Mark Hoberman. We'll see you next week on Question Reality. Oh, watch the Oscars. Bye. You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona right here on L.A. Talk Radio.